Let's play a quick game. Picture the North Pole. Got it? Chances are, you imagined Santa, some penguins, maybe a few candy canes stuck in the snow. But here's the thing. You just made a scientific faux pas. First off, penguins live in the South. And second, there's no land under the North Pole. Just water. Cold, salty, ice-covered ocean water. And yes, it's as weird as it sounds. Because when most of us think of the top or bottom of the Earth, we assume there must be some solid land holding all that ice up. After all, Antarctica is a proper continent. You can build a base on it, drill into it, even walk around without fear of falling through. But the North Pole? It's just floating, like an ice cube in a very, very big glass of ocean. So, why is that? Why does the South Pole have a massive landmass and the North Pole is just watery disappointment? To answer that, we need to talk geology, plate tectonics, ocean currents, and maybe a little Earth history. Buckle up. The basics. What's under the ice? If you could magically melt all the Arctic ice and take a submarine ride straight down, you wouldn't hit land. You'd just keep going down into the Arctic Ocean. Eventually, you'd reach the seafloor. But that floor is thousands of feet deep. There's no hidden island or secret continent up there. The ice you see at the North Pole is seasonal and permanent sea ice, not ice sitting on land. Now, compare that with the South Pole. Down there, it is not just floating ice doing the splits on the ocean. No, sir. Under all that Antarctic ice? A literal continent. We're talking real estate. Solid ground, mountains, valleys, lakes, even ancient rivers frozen in time like they just hit pause 30 million years ago. And that land matters, a lot, because when ice sits on rock, it stays put, kind of like a mattress on a bed frame. But at the North Pole, it's more like trying to sleep on a waterbed that's also melting. One gives you stability, the other gives you anxiety and penguin-sized puddles. Also, fun fact, some parts of the Antarctic ice sheet are over a mile thick. That's enough ice to bury the entire Empire State Building with room to spare. So yeah, the South Pole is basically the heavyweight champ of cold, while the North Pole is just doing its best on a floating slushy. Let's back up 200 million years, the continents of Earth didn't always look the way they do now. Back in the day, we had Pangaea, one supercontinent that eventually broke apart and drifted into the continents we know today. As part of this continental dance, Antarctica got shoved toward the bottom of the world and settled right over the South Pole. Solid land, parked directly at the southernmost point. The Arctic, on the other hand, ended up being a basin surrounded by land. North America, Europe, Asia, they all form a ring around this cold central ocean. So while the South Pole is land surrounded by ocean, the North North Pole is ocean surrounded by land. Think of it like a donut hole versus the donut. Antarctica is the hole. The Arctic is the frosting around the edge. And unlike Antarctica, which is pretty much its own frozen island, the Arctic Ocean is entirely encircled by continental landmasses, with just a few narrow sea gates allowing limited exchange with the rest of the world's oceans. This geography influences everything, from the water temperature to the ice behavior. Now you might wonder, if the North Pole is just ocean, why is it frozen at all? Oceans move. Water holds heat. Shouldn't it all be slushy? Great question. The answer lies in Earth's tilt and solar exposure. For about half the year, the North Pole doesn't see the sun at all. That lack of sunlight causes extreme cold, which allows sea ice to form and stick around. Even in summer, when the sun returns, it stays low on the horizon, barely warming the surface. Plus, the bright white ice reflects most of that sunlight back into space. Also, the Arctic Ocean is relatively landlocked, which limits how much warm ocean water can circulate in. The Greenland Ice Sheet, the Canadian Archipelago, and Siberia all act like natural bumpers, reducing the inflow of warmer currents that could melt the ice. And there's something called the thermohaline circulation, a deep ocean current driven by differences in water temperature and salinity. In the Arctic, cold, salty water sinks and drives this global conveyor belt. So, the cold helps reinforce itself in a way. So the ice survives, at least for now. Why there's no continent underneath? Let's be clear, this isn't some kind of cosmic oversight. The lack of land under the North Pole is just a quirk of plate tectonics. There's no rule saying the poles have to sit on land. In fact, they probably won't forever. Earth's crust is constantly shifting. Underneath the North Pole is part of the Eurasian Basin and the Lomonosov Ridge, underwater mountain ranges formed by tectonic processes. They aren't anywhere near tall enough to breach the surface and form a continent. And they weren't lucky enough to be pushed into polar prominence like Antarctica. The Arctic Ocean is also relatively young in geological terms. It only opened up about 56 million years ago, which is yesterday on Earth's timescale. Antarctica, meanwhile, has been drifting around in its icy throne for over
over 100 million years. You might be wondering, could a continent eventually drift toward the North Pole? In theory, yes. Given a few hundred million years, tectonic plates could shove a landmass that way. But that's not happening anytime soon, so don't hold your breath. So, what's down there? The seafloor under the North Pole is fascinating in its own right. Scientists have found hydrothermal vents, unique deep-sea ecosystems, and hints of valuable resources like oil, gas, and rare earth minerals. But it's also incredibly hard to study because of the thick, shifting ice cover and extreme conditions. We know more about the moon than the Arctic seafloor. Seriously, deep-sea exploration missions have used icebreakers and nuclear submarines to try and map the region. What they've found includes undersea mountain ranges, volcanic ridges, and sediment layers that record climate changes over millions of years. And buried beneath the seafloor? Ancient carbon stores. If disturbed, these could be a wild card in the climate equation. But as of now, much of this remains speculative. Oddly enough, the fact that there's no land at the North Pole has created an international headache. Because nobody can plant a flag on solid ground, countries like Russia, Canada, and Denmark have raced to claim parts of the Arctic seabed based on underwater ridges and continental shelves. Russia even dropped a titanium flag on the ocean floor back in 2007, like a very cold game of underwater capture the flag. But the reality is, international law doesn't make this easy, and disputes are ongoing. Who owns the North Pole? Right now, technically, nobody. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, allows countries to extend their territory beyond the standard 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone if they can prove their continental shelf extends further. Hence the geopolitical scramble, melting ice, rising stakes. And here's where things get serious, because the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. The summer sea ice is shrinking, and it's not just about polar bears losing their real estate. Less ice means less sunlight reflected, which means more heat gets absorbed by the dark ocean water. That accelerates global warming. It also opens up new shipping routes, resource extraction, and possibly military presence. The North Pole might not have land, but that hasn't stopped humans from seeing dollar signs. Even cruise ships have started offering Arctic adventures, navigating routes that were previously impassable. The economic opportunities come with ecological risks. The North Pole might be floating, but its impact is solid. From global climate to geopolitics to ecosystem stability, this patch of frozen ocean is punching way above its weight. And maybe that's the weirdest part of all. We tend to think of the poles as quiet, static, and remote. But they're dynamic, alive, constantly shifting. The South Pole has land, the North Pole doesn't. And yet both are crucial to how life survives on Earth. And let's not forget the Arctic food chain. Ice supports algae. Algae feed zooplankton. Zooplankton feed fish. Fish feed seals, whales, and polar bears. Remove the ice. And you don't just lose scenery, you unravel an entire ecosystem. In the years ahead, the fate of the North Pole will become a litmus test for global cooperation or competition. As the ice melts, international tensions could rise over who gets access to shipping routes or untapped resources. But at the same time, it's also a place where science diplomacy is still possible. Research stations from different nations share data. Scientists work together across borders to monitor ice thickness, salinity, and temperature. It's one of the few places on Earth where countries that rarely agree on anything still share a common goal, understanding what's happening before it's too late. And maybe, just maybe, the North Pole can be more than a flashpoint. It can be a signal, an early warning system, quietly whispering truths from beneath the ice, that we are all connected, that water has memory, that even the absence of land can carry weight. The next time someone asks what's under the North Pole, tell them, nothing, and everything. No land, no continent, no penguins. But there's mystery, there's science, and there's the thin, cracking crust of a planet in flux. And in that frozen, floating ocean, the future is quietly unfolding, one melting ice flow at a time.